Nirvana exploded onto a music scene that had no mind, no depth and no substance. A young audience sick to the teeth of formulaic pop and sugar-coated rock were quickly seduced by the dark and dangerous angry band hailing from Nowheresville, USA. Their enigmatic frontman Kurt Cobain became the king of the disaffected youth with an ability to capture the feelings of millions who felt in some way or other like outsiders. He saw frailty and vulnerability, wrote about cruelty and despair. A decade has passed since Kurt took his own life. Whilst many people still revere him as an important figure who changed the face of rock and roll, there are some who feel his anarchic brand of music was merely an antidote to the big hair bands of the day. Nirvana were in the right place at the right time. Ten years on, does Kurt deserve his place amongst the seminal figures of rock music? Or was he just a self-obsessed loser who at the height of his fame threw it all away? On the 10th anniversary of Kurt's death, a photo shrine was erected outside a Virgin Megastore in central London. Fans were invited to leave their written messages as a tribute to Kurt's memory. But not all the sentiments were positive. Amongst the messages of love and admiration, someone had defaced the giant photo of Kurt with the words Muppet and Boo Hoo. In a press interview, another onlooker stated, I don't know what all the fuss is about. Kurt Cobain was nothing more than a drugged up loser who only wrote one decent tune. On that same 10th anniversary, Courtney commemorated Kurt's death in her own personal way. This is a guy who kind of gloried in things not being right and kind of never really appeared to want to look at the the upside of anything because if you look for the upside of anything you might get disappointed so it's far easier to to always look on the dark side of things. He was a multi-millionaire, had a, a wife who he appeared to be tremendously in love with and a, and a baby daughter and could have done anything, anything at all and yet he chose not to do that. How should Kurt Cobain be remembered? As somebody who sold a lot less records and had a lot less hits than the guy out of Chicago. Do you remember them? If you leave me now. Who also, in a fit of peak, blew his own brains out. The fact that we're talking about Kurt Cobain's music 10 years after the guy died explains a lot. It tells us that his music meant something and it still means something. And we're still trying to get to the bottom of what that music meant. That music is still being heard and we're still trying to fathom it out. There's never a day goes by where I don't think about him and there's never a day goes by where I don't talk about him. We know he was great because we miss him and we're still talking about him. But his music mattered to him a lot and I hope that you know people see that, that it was really so much about the music for him. I go to uh, gigs now and I see kids wearing Nirvana t-shirts and stuff. Some of those people were barely born when Nirvana were making their music. <laughs> I remember once being up in Sheffield with Steve O'Mac coming up and he was DJing and he's like, watch this, he puts Teen Spirit on, boom. It was just pandemonium, it was chaos. This is like five, six, seven years after the death. In 1991, Kurt wrote a song that was to change the face of rock and roll. It was the now legendary rock anthem Smells Like Teen Spirit, a track that literally overnight catapulted Nirvana from nowhere to rock superstardom. Obviously Smells Like Teen Spirit was a song that uh, propelled them to you know, huge success, huge fame. A song that's still in the ether now, you can still hear that song all the time. We were just all just amazed at how quickly it became so big. It went from being played, you know, a couple times a day to being played, you know, once an hour or more on the radio and singing on MTV. Everyone else sees them as rock stars, you know, and they're like, oh, you know Kurt Cobain? But you're like, well, he was a friend, you know? It's just, it's very strange. Teen Spirit holds up against pretty much any piece of ro popular rock music that you're ever going to hear. It's very exciting. It's a great punk rock song. You can tell, like, you know, then and then you'd go into Teen Spirit and whoa. when we were on tour and we'd see it on MTV and we'd like call someone else's room 
you know, time. I was quite surprised that the reaction was so intense and so immediate with that particular single. You felt like the world of music was changing right there in front of you, and I think to a degree it was. The momentum and excitement at the time was so great because everyone sensed that the album was going to do pretty well, you know. There was just a, a feeling in the air, you know, there was just like this new thing happening and no one could quite pinpoint it, but we knew that we were a part of it, you know. As soon as Teen Spirit was issued, two weeks before Nevermind, and then Nevermind came out, and then they went on this club tour, all of a sudden, he was everywhere. It's really one of the remarkable things. It's, it is comparable to Beatlemania in the sense that one day, most people in America don't know a damn thing about him. The next day, everyone is asking themselves, who is this guy? He recorded Teen Spirit and that album, Nevermind. And before it came out, he went back to Seattle. He'd been evicted from his flat and he lived in his car. So between the time that that album was made and the time it came out, he was living in a car. That's how poor he was. That's how real it was at that time. In 1990, I think, applied for a job cleaning shit out of a dog kennel and he didn't get the job. Um, that shows how desperate, in a way, that uh, he was. And the other members of Nirvana were no better. They were living in fairly, you know, unprepossessing circumstances. That's, you know, they regarded, for them, from a depressed uh, working class background uh, that they came from, rock and roll was a career option, in a sense. It was an escape. So it really connected, I think. It was a proper form of music that meant something to a new generation of people. Kurt was born in 1967 in the isolated, depressing logging town of Aberdeen, Washington. Since the decline of logging, Aberdeen had become a virtual ghost town with boarded up stores and run down bars amidst a handful of pawn shops overflowing with guns, chainsaws and electric guitars. Kurt had, by his own admission, a relatively happy childhood until the age of eight when his parents divorced. He claimed the acrimonious traumatic split fueled the angst in much of his early lyrics. He discussed his childhood with me quite a bit, actually. He talked about how he had a pretty happy childhood until his parents got divorced. And then after that, he just was pretty much miserable. You know, he lived with his dad and his stepmom for a while, and he felt like his dad wanted him to be a jock and all the things that he couldn't do, didn't want to do. He was uh, taking wrestling in school. Him and his dad weren't getting along, and his dad went to one of the wrestling matches, and <laughs> Kurt just relaxed and let the guy throw him all over the place, wouldn't fight back. <laughs> his dad got mad and embarrassed him, and he'd and he done it just on account of his dad, and his dad walked out on him. They once took me to where they came from, uh, Aberdeen, and it was like going back 20 years. It's just, it used to be a, a thriving logging community, and then as soon as the logging was taken away, it, it was just a ghost town. And every house looked like it, it was, I was in a, a closet serial killer or something, and they were telling you all these like weird macabre stories about Aberdeen. I was surprised by the level of uh, poverty and despair that he had growing up. Kurt wrote the song about living under the bridge and told that story, which I found out was mythical. He didn't really live under the bridge, but the true story was even sadder. Underneath the bridge, top is sprung a leak and I... he uh, was homeless for a time and he broke into houses that were being built and slept there. He would go into the hospital that he had been born in and he would sleep in the waiting room because he wanted a warm place to sleep. And he figured if he was in a hospital, nobody would come up and say, why are you here? Um, what a horrible, sad existence that his life had led to that point. Well, I think his childhood shaped him quite a bit. I think he probably always wanted to be um, accepted by, by someone close to him since he didn't really feel accepted by his mother or his father. And I think that's part of the reason maybe why he sought fame. But uh, it's kind of hard to say. I think he had a hard time maybe in relationships. He wanted to get close to people and be loved, but at the same time he had a hard time uh, maybe accepting that he was loved. <laughs> 
1987, Kurt teamed up with school friend Chris Novoselic, who was impressed by an early demo tape of Kurt's first band, Fecal Matter. After a few jams and a name change, Nirvana was born. They completed the early lineup with drummer Chad Channing. I first met Kurt at a show in uh, Tacoma, uh, this place called the Tacoma World Theater. And that was, um, that was actually in 87. They were looking for a drummer. And they said, hey, we're, we're actually playing the show uh, at the Evergreen Campus. You know, why don't you uh, come check us out and, you know, see what you think. After the show, we talked and stuff, and they were like, hey, you know, would you like to be a drummer? In early January of 1988, uh, I just got a phone call from a guy named Kurt from Aberdeen who said he was a friend of the Melvins and he wanted to come up and, and record. And that led to the first um, Nirvana studio session, which was January 23rd of 19. 88. We wrote so many songs in that week right before we recorded that we, we, were, we were excited about the new songs. We wanted to record them and we wanted to just record a f the few new songs that we had and re-record re most of the stuff that was on the Fecal Matter tape. But we just happened to write so many new songs. He sent his tapes off to about, I think about 25 or so different record companies including Alternative Tentacles and a lot of other ones, ones that scratch, the one that Scratch Ads was on and so forth. And uh, he was pretty disappointed that he didn't get any response from most of them. I think he got a, two or three letters back to them that they weren't interested. And that really bummed him out a lot. We were just making records like everybody else was. We were making Jack and Dino produced records recorded at Reciprocal Studios on an 8-track. They actually left the tape at the studio for a while uh, with the idea that, oh, maybe we'll come back and do some more work on the tape later when we get some money. And I said, well, do you mind if I give your tape to some people? Because I thought it was really good. And uh, I thought some friends of mine would really enjoy hearing this. So I gave some tapes to people, and one of them got to John Poneman at Sub Pop. I heard that uh, Sub Pop was interested in making a single. So the next recording session I had with them was in June of 1988, when we did the Love Buzz 7-inch and a couple of other songs, which later ended up on the Bleach album. As far as Kurt thought about the band and, and, and I, you know, long-term goals and success, I don't think he thought a lot about it. I mean, I know at one point, you know, it was said that he always thought that, you know, he'd, you know, be a rock star in this band and, you know, and that'd be that, but it was never anything he ever spoke uh, openly. At least for me, there was something that I just sort of felt, you know, Kurt had something that was really unique and cool. That, uh, that was gonna, you know, come out eventually at some point. You know, I think the big question was when. Kurt and Nirvana didn't have to wait long. Word had filtered through to the British music press about the burgeoning new music scene in Seattle, where Nirvana were already making their mark locally. Nirvana's music came through um, the British music press around uh, the late 80s via mostly a guy called Everett True, who was working for Melody Maker at the time and who fell in with the nascent Seattle scene and he came back talking about <clears throat> a ton of different bands he was a huge fan of this band Tad and as a byproduct he kept he, he mentioned this other band Nirvana and he started to bring their we started to hear their records because he'd bring them into the office all we knew was that they were drawing big crowds and they were wild shows and that this guy was a fairly wild character I was convinced that of the bands emanating from Seattle at this point, Nirvana were profoundly different from, from all the others. Um, there was a streak of intensity uh, in their music and in their performance that uh, was different from the intensity that marked out these other bands. But Nirvana were different in, uh, in certain measures from those other bands, and a lot of that difference you'd have to put down to, um, to Kurt Cobain. There was a bit of a little undercurrent vibe about this to sort of band from Seattle and they uh, brought this album out, Bleach, which sounded a bit punky. You could see it come from a punk origin, but it had something else about it, a kind of different flavour, you know. It had something, something unusual a little bit, you know. And I thought, yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's something screaming trying to get out there, you know. There's something interesting and powerful about Kurt's voice and the way the whole band plays. The gig that they played in, in the UK that really made the, a huge impression on me um, was when they played at the London Astoria in December 1989. They were just playing this music so vehemently and intensely as, as if it would be their last gig ever. The, the very end of, the, of their show was um, marked when Kurt Cobain 
hurled his guitar at uh, Chris Novoselic, the bass player, and uh, Chris was ready for it. He held his bass like a, a, as, a, as a baseball batter would, waiting for the, for the final pitch in the World Series or something. And then the string of um, memorable TV appearances that he did in, in a very short space of time, and it, which was kind of like a merry sort of mayhem that they were uh, reeking across the UK mainstream scene. Here's Nirvana kicking it up good style. 600,000 copies of their album in the USA. And first time live on TV. See you next week. When Nirvana came on the world, I, I do remember me and Caroline were sitting in the sort of cafeteria bit at Limehouse Studios where we were filming the world at the time. And we were taking the piss out of uh, Kurt Cobain. And it might have been his tour manager, his record company bloke who was with him all the time because he wasn't with the rest of the band. And he just seemed to sit in the, the cafeteria bit with endless cups of coffee all day, you know, in, be, in between rehearsals, and looked absolutely wasted, you know. I mean, we were laughing. Uh, I mean, it was weird because it was almost like it was like clockwork. You looked dead, then he went and rehearsed, and in rehearsal, absolutely fantastic. I'd like all of you people in this room to know that Courtney Love, the lead singer of the sensational pop group Hole, is the best fuck in the world. And he did like his intro bit, didn't he? You know, Courtney Hall is the best fuck in the world. You know, we're expecting us to be shot, but we're just, I'm just sitting there thinking, get on with it, mate. You've only got about two minutes. Don't start making any speeches. The word didn't realize what they had. It's mm -hmm. like they take credit now for, for breaking Nirvana and being their first TV thing, but... Except it was already broken. Yeah, and, and they, they just looked out. In 1991, they finally signed a contract with the major label Geffen Records. For Kurt, it was like a dream come true. They had the big budget, the big producer, and Geffen wanted the big album. And they don't come any bigger than Nevermind. <laughs> Nirvana! The winner is Nirvana, smells like Team Spirit. There is no way to prepare for success in general. There is certainly no way to prepare for the success that walloped him. You know, he, in the fall of 1991, suddenly he was everywhere. And this was a guy who had spent most of his life feeling like he was nowhere. I'd like to thank my family and our record label and our true fans. He didn't necessarily, I don't think, he had the capacity to, to deal with it sort of psychologically. And I mean, it was really straight from Aberdeen to, to the big time. That's a lot to deal with. I think Kurt enjoyed his success up to a point. Um, I think there was always aspects of success that he found difficult. The invasive aspects of success, you know, the invasion of um, the media into his life, I think he found them more and more difficult to deal with. And he said, all my life, my biggest dream has been to be a famous rock and roll star. I might as well abuse this opportunity while I can. It sort of became an obsession, I think, with all Nirvana fans. Kurt Cobain was the one person we hung on to, um, slightly obsessively. Um, and, I, and I think, unfortunately, he didn't, he didn't want that. But we wanted him so badly. There's nothing more embarrassing than a group of people walking up to you and, and, and shaking and clamoring and, and you know and, and and praising you like you're some kind of fucking god or something it's it's embarrassing he flatly said that you know if there had ever been a college course rock star 101 he would have liked to have taken it as soon as he became popular in a way he became kind of a pariah too and that really bugged him you know the idea that he couldn't just you know, be a part of the audience the way he had been. He was conflicted. He wanted to be successful on one level, you know. He very much wanted the radio to play his records. He wanted MTV to show his videos. And, um, and yet he resisted or balked at some of the consequences of that desire to be successful as well. I got tired of people thinking, trying to put too much meaning into my lyrics, you know, it's being too... Uh, not making no sense, you know. So I decided uh, to be really blunt and bold. I think there were parts of being a rock star that Kurt really liked. Um, he loved to get room service and he loved to see his name in the paper. And then there were other things he didn't like. He didn't like the pressure he felt. He didn't like the fact that the fame didn't really seem to solve the other issues in his life. In fact, they only seemed to complicate him. Um, 
So uh, it was a two-sided sword, and unfortunately you can't get the level of fame he had and also live a quiet existence. There are very few rock stars that have been able to do that. The magnitude of the success and the, the rapidity with which it arrived, once it did arrive, I think it overwhelmed them and it overwhelmed Kurt in particular. And um, having witnessed the degree with which it happened, I think it would, it would be surprising if anybody wouldn't have been profoundly affected by that. But for somebody as troubled as Kurt, I think it was inevitable that it would affect him very deeply indeed. He never expected to be a, a megastar. And when it went ballistic, Kurt had a lot of problems dealing with it. And he, he had a lot of problems coming to terms with it because he's punk rock kid on one side, but then he's, he's megastar on the other side. Well, Cobain was such a contradictory figure because it like, it was he planned his whole fame. He planned his whole career. And part of him really, really thought he deserved it and wanted it and wanted to enjoy it. And part of him wouldn't let wouldn't let him enjoy it. I think his wife, Courtney, was trying to get him to enjoy the trappings, you know, but when he made all this money, he bought a car, he bought a second-hand car. You know, he couldn't, couldn't let it go. I remember we were flying out to Portugal and uh, we met up with him and uh, they came to our dressing room, Kirk came right away and we was having a, a chat about all kinds of things, you know and joking and stuff and you know he's been a bit cynical about hey you know about being a super pop star now you know and all that sort of stuff which um, in one way didn't seem like it I think he obviously wanted his music to get heard and he you know what he was saying he wanted to get out there but um dealing with the other stuff I think uh, you know um, he had a few problems with it really you know there was always that irony about it all you know he worked at it he wanted it and then when he got it, he realized that all of the work that he put into it had been about the music and all the other stuff that was gonna suck up his time, suck up the air, you know, suck up his energy and his, his love for the fans that he really cared about. You know, he just wished, man, I wish I had the time to deal with that. He never got that time. Kurt created a sound that was an amalgamation of raw punk, hard metal and pop melody, then added his own dark brooding lyrics. Kurt had found an audience who felt his pain and related it to their own. But despite the iconic status that Kurt had reached, close friends saw a very different person. What I liked about Kurt, I guess, a lot was his personality. He, was, he, was, he could be very funny. He would tell jokes and, and play jokes and, and, on people. He uh, liked a lot of the same kind of music that I did. He liked a lot of us doing the same sort of things, and he was very artistic too. He could draw really well. Kurt was a very uh, sort of quiet, uh, gentle, easygoing kind of guy. Just nice guys, very low key, uh, no rock stars. I mean, the jokey side of things, he's like, when some huge tour bus had turned up to pick him up from the hotel, because we'd be staying in the hotel, and we'd be leaving, he'd want to get in our bus, you know. And the, you know, didn't happen every day, but he'd go, I want to come with you guys and just sit in the back, you know. He played guitar all the time. It was just like he'd sit there and watch TV and play guitar and just kind of fiddle around with songs. Sometimes it'd be, you know, Beatles songs he'd be playing. Sometimes it'd be like little chords or notes, and other times it'd be songs that he was writing. But um, he, just, he just loved music, whether it was listening to it or playing it, you know, having it around. Kurt's personality was, uh, was a very soft one to me. Um, you know, it was very quiet. Um, you know, I mean, if he was, he rarely showed, you know, like really intense enthusiasm over anything. He just wasn't a very emotional character, you know, at least not that I ever saw. Well, if he got his feelings hurt somewhere, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at him. Like later on, he'd be fuming about it or mad or, or sad about how he was treated. And he tried to be, um, you know, he could be, joke and be one of the guys and be kind of mean sometimes if he was talking to someone he don't like but generally he would try to be more you know sensitive of other people's feelings too i think it was an archetypal indie kid in one way uh disturbed because of his childhood in another way and um but very uh, strong as well in another way you know powerful to deal with it you know if he didn't like something i think he'd tell you you know every time you did something he was so appreciative the tiniest interview, the littlest mention. Um, 
he, he was always thankful and, and always made a point of thanking you for, for, for your efforts, even though you'd virtually done nothing. He always appreciated it. We, we've got this kind of obsessive sort of guy who, who was obsessed with becoming famous, with every single little detail of his, of his career all mapped out and loads of lists of his favourite bands and rewritten to make him look cool and some people out, some people in and this idea that, you know, he would map out and storyboard all of his own videos and, you know, complete control freak on the one hand and on the other hand this rather immature, it must be said, um, glass half empty sort of guy who kind of gloried in things not being right. He was a guy who would happily give you a quote like, you know, uh, I don't think anybody should be looked upon as a god or it's crap to be called a god or whatever. On the other hand, he kind of loved it, really. He was a pretty pathetic and nasty piece of work in many ways, I think. The guy made some brilliant music, but he was a pretty crap human being. But the key to Nirvana's success was Kurt's dark, enigmatic performances. His haunting vocals, sometimes rasping, sometimes yelling, pouring out his brooding view of the world. That was the one thing that struck me about them was his particular ear for melody. He would have these strange guitar riffs, but then he would have a vocal melody that was completely different that seemed to interlock with the guitar riffs in a totally bizarre way. And of course now, in retrospect, you look at Nevermind and it's got all these amazing vocal melodies on it. There are certain people within music who have tremendous voices, and they have voices with an emotional timbre to them that are unique. And Kurt Cobain is one of those, those, those talents. One of the first things that I remember hearing in Nirvana's music that just stopped me in my tracks was the way that Kurt's voice could just sort of move from this like quite mellow sort of mumble almost to this desperate cry and um, it wasn't in any way uh, affected in any way, I don't think. It was, it, it sounded, you, you believe that this guy was sort of, you know, screaming from his very soul. You could hear pain in his voice. You, you could hear the pain, which was so obvious in his, in his voice. And I think that's why so many people um, identified with him. His musical talent is prob probably goes a bit unnoticed because of his fame in some ways, but, um, <clears throat> um, I mean, he had a fantastic voice. I mean, uh, you know, he could bellow it out and uh, people can shout on records and stuff like that. But his kind of shouting was like, it was like this uh, volcano, this explosion of pain. And it sounded great as well. It wasn't just somebody with a rock voice. It was like this uh, rock voice that was like quite emotional pain and it sounded fantastic, you know. It was like he opened his, ripped his heart open and said, have some of this, have a look at this, you know, see what this is like, you know. Personal things in it, but for the most part, it's just, um, it's just, it's, it's very, it's very unpersonal, you know, impersonal, you know. And um, I think that'll be a surprise to a lot of people. I think Kurt Cobain um, deserves his reputation as a, as a great artist, great rock star, because he had a very direct and brutal way of communicating. So these were pop songs about anti-pop kind of things. So it was quite subversive and very, very exciting. How did Kurt deal with being a rock star? Drugs. <laughs> At the tender age of seven, Kurt was prescribed the drug Ritalin to try to counteract his hyperactivity. Whilst the treatment only lasted a few months, it seemed to balance his mind. By the time he shot up heroin for the first time in 1986, Kurt was plagued by constant chronic stomach pain and the onset of manic depression. I was in pain. I mean, I was in pain for so long that I didn't care if I was in a band. I didn't care if I was alive, you know. And it just so happened that I came to that conclusion at a time when my band became really popular, you know. I mean, it had been going on and, and building up for so many years that I was, you know, suicidal. I mean, I just didn't want to live, so I just thought, if I'm going to die, if I'm going to kill myself, I should take some drugs, you know. <laughs> May as well become a junkie, because I felt like a junkie every day, you know.
He discovered that heroin was the ultimate security blanket. He got himself into the mindset that drugs could fix his problems. The first prescription drug he was really given was Ritalin because he was hyperactive at the time, they thought. And there is quite a bit of medical literature debating whether it's a positive thing to give kids at that point. Many people find that it helps calm kids down, but there are others who argue that by letting kids think that drugs can affect their mood and, and getting them sort of hooked on this cycle of drugs can control you psychologically, they've argued that kids that took Ritalin are more likely to do drugs later in life. I think he didn't deal with the rock and roll lifestyle very well. I think that he was uh, very troubled by the fact that he couldn't go anywhere without being recognized and asked for autographs and mobbed. And couldn't get through dinner without a lot of people asking him to talk to him and tell him how great he was. I think uh, even though Chris was more recognizable, I think Chris had an easier time of dealing with it. And unfortunately, I think he decided to turn to drugs to help relieve the pain. Uh, the wife and I never did, knew he was on dope. Uh, we never knew it. He never was when he was around here. And uh, his mother kept saying, oh, that's just uh, publicity. He don't take dope. That's just publicity. And then she said he was a man of depressant and there was nothing that could be done for him. And I think there was. I think there could have been things done for him. So messed up, I want you here. In my room, I want you here. For somebody who spent quite a lot of his time railing against hypocrites, he was a tremendously hypocritical person and he, sp and he spent a lot of time when there were lots of rumours about him being a junkie and being unable to manage his habit. He spun a load of ridiculous tales about how he had narcolepsy and all this rubbish and then in his diary he would snigger that, that, he, that the stupid British press had swallowed this story whole again and stuff like that. It was so hypocritical and so in some ways pathetic and he never really came clean with any of it. I think he was impressionable as well. I think he would take stuff on, you know. His sort of narcolepsy that appeared, I never thought that that ever uh, that was ever apparent before he saw my own private Idaho. In Teen Spirit, you seem to complain about the apathy of our generation. Is that right? Whatever you want to make out of it, it's up to you. And do you share this? It's your crossword puzzle. And do you share this lack of engagement yourself? What, being apathetic? Yeah. Sure. Why? Why? Because we sleep too much. His uh, illicit drug use began in earnest in high school, and basically he would have taken anything anybody gave him. Uh, he claimed in his journal that he began doing narcotics at that point. I couldn't find evidence of that. If he did, the only narcotics he probably could have gotten in Aberdeen might have been some codeine tablets or something that he ripped off from somebody's medicine cabinet. Um, heroin, which is a drug that is most closely associated with Kurt Cobain in the popular literature and the popular myth, really was a drug he didn't begin doing until the last three years of his life. It was during these years it became evident that Kurt's drug intake was spiraling out of control, clearly affecting his mood and personality. I almost got into fist fight with Kurt in Central Park because I was complaining to Courtney that he was, he was becoming Axl Rose, he was becoming a parody of everything. He'd, he set out not to be, and me and him got into a confrontation. And, and I had to back down because there was a photographer standing over there with a the camera waiting to do the pictures for the cover. And I'm stood there and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, and, and you could see him getting angry and angry, and I'm thinking, back down, sensible thing to do. And then later on that night, he came up and gave me a big hug and a kiss. Like, oh, I'm really sorry, and you know, I, you, you, you know, you're right what you said. I, I did spend some time on the tour buses with, with him, and uh, you know, he was up to other things that distort your mind, and uh, that affects your behaviour, you know. It, uh, it could be up and down with that sort of thing. So one day he'd turn up in the dressing room, we'd be really up, and another day, you, you know, be down. But that was probably through substances as well, you know, as well as the uh, rigours of touring, you know. I remember being in New York, and um, um, this was press for Neutro, and we had loads of people out there and Kurt OD'd that day. And uh, it was, th this is a launch for an album. 
of the biggest band in the world and the singer ODs. You know, you, you break into his bedroom, you hear a scream, you break in to find him slumped behind the door with the syringe. And Kelly, you remember Kelly, the nanny, mm -hmm. rushed in and like smacked him in the solar plexus and he <gasps> came around. Played a gig that night, though. Um, yeah, they, they played a gig that night and everything. I lose my heart on the burning sand. The last time I ever saw Nirvana was in uh, it was Valentine's Day in Paris. Oh, yeah. When they were touring. It was a good show, that one. Yeah, and it was... But I remember going backstage and I remember Kurt's face just being all fucked up and he was, it was all scabby and just like... You could sense an atmosphere it well. and it just wasn't, it just wasn't right and he was kind of... It was really sad, actually. And Kurt was really friendly and, and I remember hugging him and yeah. talking and everything, but... It just wasn't right. You, you just knew there was something wrong and it wasn't the best tour to be on. Two weeks before that, I'd been seeing them in Portugal and, you know, people were getting along with each other, sat them curt, had a really good chat. And then there we are a few days later and he's like, he's very much withdrawn. Less than two weeks later, Kurt was to play his last gig in Munich at the ironically named Terminal Lights. During the gig, Chris Novoselic jokingly alluded to a Nirvana split, telling the audience, we're on the wane, grunge is dead, Nirvana is over. From Munich, Kurt flew to Rome where he was joined by Courtney. In the early hours of the following morning, Courtney awoke to find Kurt in a drug-induced coma. He had apparently taken 50 to 60 rohypnol tablets. Although described as an accidental overdose, many believe it was a suicide attempt. Cobain's frustrations led him down a road of drug abuse and depression. Last month in Rome, wife Courtney Love rushed to his side after a combination of champagne and painkillers left the singer comatose. Looking at, at him in some ways on that tour, maybe, you know, things were going on like that, you know. With, with hindsight, it did seem like he could have been building up to that, you know. Because I don't think you just do it at the drop of a hat, you know. I think it's a real shame that he, that he turned to heroin. I think it's, uh, I wish he would have found a better way to deal with things, either if, I don't know if he needed antidepressants or just if he should have tried to maybe not tour as much and stay out of the public eye and just back off a little bit and gradually ease into becoming more famous instead of, they did a lot of touring, they did a lot of shows, they were out there a lot, you know, those couple of years before he ended up dying. Time takes a cigarette, puts it in your mouth. You pull on your finger. On the 8th of April, 1994, Kurt was found dead from a gunshot wound to the head. A post-mortem discovered that before the shotgun blast, he had shot up a potentially lethal dose of heroin. He was just 27 years old. You're a rock and roll suicide. When I first heard Kurt, uh, Kurt passed away, I was uh, driving with a friend of mine, and we were just driving down the road. I don't know where we were headed, but hopped in my car and we took off and we listened to the radio. And uh, I just happened to turn on, uh, you know, one of the local local stations, and I heard this bleep where this guy came in and he said uh, it is the body is it has not been said which you know, whose body it is or something like that and then it just kind of cut off to like a commercial and it was really odd because without really knowing and waiting through a commercial break somehow i was thinking that's probably kurt i don't know why i don't know what made me think that i just felt it it's like that's probably kurt because i don't know it's strange to say or think this, but I always sort of felt that one day it would have might have ended up like that. Oh no, love, you're not alone. You're watching yourself, but you're too unfair. You've got your head all tangled up, but I'm not alone. When Kurt died, um, 
it wasn't a surprise. It was a, it was a shock. It was a horrific shock, but you couldn't say you were surprised. Um, things seemed to have been downwardly spiralling for some time, very quickly. Um, so no, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised. I was actually at home, I remember it was a weekday and I had the day off work, which was kind of nice, and uh, my friend Alice called me and she said she had heard it on the radio, I wanted to know if I heard, and I said I hadn't. And uh, it was just hard too, because everyone kept calling and saying, how are you, did you hear, you know? And, it was just hard for you to believe that he did that, especially with having a, you know, a young daughter, too. I was, I was devastated, and I think everyone around him just didn't see that one coming. People might have thought he might have died of a drug overdose accidentally, but nobody thought he would actually you know, shoot himself. It was really difficult. You're not alone! got to about six o'clock and Alex McLeod, tour manager, calls up and he's like, he's dead. Yeah. And, and I was just stunned, absolutely stunned. It was, it felt like the end of my world. Mm. It was the first time I've ever had a friend die in any circumstances. And Kurt, Kurt might have been a rock star and he, he, he might have been in Nirvana, but he was still a friend. And, yeah. and I think it's hand on heart. We, we can say he was a friend of ours. The, the shock, you know, the, the shock that it was him, the shock that he was so young, and the shock of, of how it had apparently happened was just, it was overwhelming. It was the shock of someone young, someone famous, someone really successful, someone really good at what he did and not being here anymore and in a most unimaginably violent way. In the immediate aftermath, I had to write an article. It was the obituary in the, in the New Musical Express that following week. And I just said, you know, none of us, none of us realized how troubled he was. You know, we all knew that he, had, he was in trouble, but I don't think any of us, except those closest to him, and who knows, maybe not even them, truly realised how troubled he was. Um, like I said, it's just, you know, it's just dreadful and it's just a damn shame he's not still here. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel the lead singer of Nirvana, a rock group especially popular with people in their teens and 20s, shot and killed himself at his home in Seattle, Washington today. The electrician was going to do some repair work. When he looked inside, he saw a man lying on the floor. It was obvious this man is dead from a The shotgun. old familiar sting Try to kill it all away But I remember everything uh, the next few weeks were pretty hard because people kept calling and asking how you were doing and um, people magazine kept trying to come to my house and they, they knocked on my door and I didn't answer trying to get you know because they wanted photographs and stuff but you know how people magazine is you don't want to give them anything and uh, the funeral itself was hard they had pictures of Curtis little boy there that was really hard to look at just uh I think all the publicity stuff too made it hard to, you couldn't open the paper without seeing something about it, so it was really hard to not even think about it for a few weeks. When I went to the funeral, um, that's, that's, when it, that's when things just kind of really, you know, kind of grabbed me, you know. That was, uh, that's when it was the most hardest for me. The whole, like, last, like, seven or eight of the, uh, you know, uh, pews in the, in the church were empty, and I don't know, I didn't feel like the need to like be with everybody else. I basically just walked in and hung a right and sat, you know, f towards the very, very back and just kind of almost played an observing role, you know. I, I don't know, for some reason I felt like I didn't really belong there. I'm not sure why. Two days after Kurt's death, 7,000 fans attended a candlelit vigil outside Seattle's Center Flag Pavilion. 
A taped message from Chris Novoselic was played along with Nirvana tunes, followed by a recording of Courtney Love reading out Kurt's suicide note. Later, she attended the vigil and handed out items of Kurt's clothes. We will never know what drove Kurt Cobain to suicide. Certainly, the demands of fame conflicted with his sensitive artistic integrity. He understood how much his fans identified with him and needed him. But Kurt was torn in two. He felt the guilt for having lost the enthusiasm for writing and playing, and he couldn't live the charade of being the big rock star. He couldn't lie to his fans, and he couldn't lie to himself. For Kurt, suicide was the only way out. There were many, many reasons that one could point to for, for his suicidal tendencies. Um, he'd had suicide in his family. He'd had a history of mental illness. I think that ultimately is where we have to begin. Um, I think if Kurt Cobain hadn't been a rock star, there's a good chance that, that suicide could have been an issue in his life. He had a number of suicides in his family. He himself thought that suicide was genetic. I, mean, I think that there are just enormous responsibility and pressure there, you know, to, to live up to, to being this sort of overnight icon and sensation. I think it was just too much on his plate all at once. I don't know if that's necessarily why he killed himself. I think that's a bit more complex than, than just fame, but it was certainly a, a factor in it. A lot of what went down with Kurt Cobain was because he was surrounded by a load of people for whom he was the cash cow. And so despite what we know now about the lots of interventions that went on and the tough love and all that stuff about trying to get him off the junk. Ultimately, it's always dangerous when somebody's the real talent and everybody else is sucking up to them and he was in that terrible place, I think. It's a very existentialist thing, you know, to kill yourself is the final thing, you know. If you can't deal with life anymore, you know. And it seemed, in some ways, it was kind of getting like that, you know. To me, Kurt was one of the first people I'd death by media. They hounded him so much into a corner and um, they just wouldn't leave him alone. And I contributed to push him over the end. Now, some people will say because he was a mega star and because who he is, then they've got a right to be able to write about him and hound him. And to an extent, they have, but not to the degree they did with Nirvana. It's that everybody wanted a piece of him and Courtney. He was always on the move, something was always happening, and uh, he never found a place to escape it. And, uh, you know, that did play a role in his death, but I think in sometimes that's overstated. Um, he could have quit his career rather than killed himself. That was certainly an option that was available. He didn't feel it was available, and I think that speaks more to some of his early childhood issues and some of his psychological challenges than it does to the price of fame itself. At the end of the day, he, he had a very contradictory relationship with the rock lifestyle and with fame. And he thought he wanted it, and he knew that he didn't. And he could never make those two things gel or, or, or live alongside each other in any way. Kurt the icon and Kurt the man were two very different people. He never seemed comfortable in the midst of the media glare being hailed as a rock star. Those that knew Kurt well are still marred by his tragic loss. I think it was just kind of like, almost like being robbed, you know? There was just certain things that I kind of wanted to say, you know, things that I would have liked to have, you know, talked with him about, you know? Not necessarily anything specific, just that we hadn't talked in a while, you know? And I realized that was gone. You know, that was, that was, that was, that was the hardest part for me. It was just gone. You know, it was, the opportunity wasn't even gonna happen anymore, so. After he died, I found it um, really hard to listen to Nirvana. And, uh, the songs had a lot of memory for me, so I just didn't play any of the music for a long time. That's the surprising thing is after years not listening to it because I thought it would make me sad. It's actually I like to listen to it with people around or listen to it you know, in the car and with my kids and, and so on. It's actually not, I'm getting choked up about it now, but really I can listen to it now without crying. But I'll remember him the way I, I remember him at the time, not from uh, any varnished image that has subsequently been handed down by whoever. 
I remember him as a sweet, funny, intense guy. I think he, he represents a lot to people that are trying to figure themselves out in that way, you know. There is darkness and that it does make you angry and it does make you frustrated and uh, so it's good for that and he's, he's, he's left that as a, a kind of monument really. I think that's part of his epitaph for that, you know. I think Kurt should be remembered with um, a lot of love and respect. As long as you stop and think about what he's singing about and realise what he was about, I think then his job is done. I'm sorry he's not here today, um, but if he really wanted to leave us, then, you know, we should have, well, we should let him go uh, with love. We're all doing what we can to get by. I really hope that uh, people see Kurt in a, in a good light. Just a guy with his music who made a good contribution and We'll keep it at that. I, I would just hope that he'd be remembered more as not just as a musician or someone that, you know, flamed out, dying of a drug overdose, dying of a drug overdose, but somebody that was artistic, that did a lot of paintings, that did a lot of writing, that um, cared about other people, you know, and things that are going on in the world, not just himself. I, I remember him as a good kid, is the way I remember him. He always helped around here when he lived with us. Oh, he was. Good kid. They say, you know, like whenever like they play like, you know, smells like Teen Spirit on the radio and like they get so many phone calls, it was like, what was that, you know? It's almost like it's a new band. But yeah, because it still sounds really fresh, you know? But I think it's safe to say that what Nirvana meant to us when they first came around, it's exactly the same to these kids. Yeah. And, and for, for music to transcend like that, as, that is such a gift. That is such an amazing feat, you know? And, and as much as I like a lot of music around at the moment, but there's none of these people can even touch Kurt. I think the greatest honor to Kurt Cobain when we think of him is, is really the music, is to listen to his music and to realize that he put himself into those grooves. My girl, my girl don't lie to me. Tell me, where did you sleep last night? Come on, tell me, baby. But had he lived, what might the future have held for Kurt? How would he have progressed musically? Could he have coped and adapted, channeled his energies into other music forms? Kurt always says he'd be happy to be as successful as Sonic Youth and just have a career, uh, which, you know, Sonic Youth has been very successful in doing exactly what they want to do and having a career for, what, 20 years. Uh, I think Kurt would have been very satisfied, you know, artistically and otherwise, to have that sort of longevity. And, um, you know, as it all turned out, it, it exploded and got out of control. But burdened with the unwanted cross of being hailed as a spokesman for a generation, it was a cross simply too heavy for Kurt to bear. Bob Dylan, he was given that voice of a generation. He passed it off, because who, you know, who's, who's going who's gonna to take that on, you know, and, and pull it off without being some total megalomaniac. The question we ultimately ask whenever we say, well, is he worth these accolades? Is he worth this kind of treatment and reverence? Really what we're asking ourselves is, you know, what would he have done if he hadn't died? Would we think what he was doing now, 10 years later, was as good as never mind? And we would be measuring him against that. I like to think that Whatever he was going through, whatever he had stopped doing, he was entirely capable of starting it again. That's the only thing that's always struck me is that the body of work was so small that it's hard for me to see how it can have, how you can actually put it in the same class as something like the Beatles or the Stones or the Who where you've got just this huge evolution of style that went on over decades and you know this high quality level that just continued. Um, so it would have been interesting to see what he was doing, you know, if he was still making music now, what his, you know, what he would have, what it would have turned into. He told numerous people that he was going to change, that he was tired of screaming, he was tired of all the shouting and the loud music, and he wanted to do quiet, pretty music. And um, so where he would have gone, I don't know. He was talking quite a bit about collaborating with other people. He wanted to collaborate with Michael Stipe. He even had joked about collaborating with Bono, you know. So. There's so many things you could have imagined him doing in the course of his, his life. Um, sadly, we, we'll never get a chance to see what the outcome of that would have been. And it still bothers me 
it bugs me. It, it, it does all kinds of things to me to think that I'm not going to hear any more of his music any more than I'm not going to hear any more Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison or Janis Joplin or any of the other musicians that I've written obituaries about. To say that he's a loser, you know, don't say it unless you're standing there in the, the exact same circumstances and with all of those feelings and all of those troubles literally in your face. You know, if you've, if you've confronted it and moved on, maybe you've got more to say about it than I do. But no one person confronts the exact same feelings, terrors, emotions, circumstances, in, like that. If he were alive today, I would hope that he would still be playing music and that he would still be doing art and I would hope that he would uh, have conquered his demons and would, would not have just dropped out of life somewhere and be lying around somewhere being miserable. It would have been tremendously interesting if he was still around now making records because probably he wouldn't be selling very many but they'd probably be pretty good because he was good at doing it. One of the last interviews he ever did when he was talking about wanting to do, have a solo career like Johnny Cash and he was excited about the fact that he just discovered, if you like, blues music and was really, really interested in going, going back to a basic sort of music and becoming a kind of almost like a, for want of a better word, a troubadour at doing it on his own. He had plans. It would be nice to eventually start playing acoustic guitars and be thought of as, as um a singer and a songwriter rather than a grunge rocker, you know? Because then I might be able to take advantage of that when I'm older and, and sit down on a chair and play acoustic guitar like like a like Johnny Cash or something, you know? And and it won't be a big joke, but who knows? This notion that, you know, he killed himself because he'd run out of ideas and he felt he was bankrupt, I think that's that's selling his musical loves a lot shorter than he deserves. You know, music was such a central part of his life, it was such a salvation to him, that um, I, don't think, I don't think he ever ran out of the music. You know, he may have run out of reasons to make it, um, or to stick around and make it, but he didn't run out of the music. I really want to change our style of music. I want to do something different, really different, you know. And I want to have enough guts to do that. And, I, and if it alienates people, that's too bad. Bye.